And for our final talk for the pesticide management session, um, I would like to introduce Andrew Negri from the Australian Institute of Marine Science, who is going to present on improving water quality thresholds for alternative pesticides in future climate conditions. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Mary Cohen. <clears throat> uh, thanks for a great introduction to the, the pesticides, Rachel. Um, so this talk is going to really cover three NEST projects um, in 15 minutes, so I'm going to be quite quick, especially when it comes to the cumulative impact side. So I'm going to focus mostly on pesticides here. Um, a lot of this work was done at the Australian Institute of Marine Science, where I led the pesticides project, and Sven Utiki led the cumulative impacts of water quality and climate change project. Um, there was also a lot of work done by Shelley's group at the Trop Water, um, at James Cook University and Shelley Templeman led the, the freshwater pesticide work. And so most of this talk is going to be on pesticides, so I've included a bunch of our really our primary stakeholders in this process, and they're from the Department of Environment and Science um, in the Queensland Government. And that's uh, Rainier Mann, who was going to give a talk with me, but we only had the 15 minutes, so uh, there wasn't really enough time. Uh, he had a major contribution. Also, Rachel, who you've just heard from, and Michael Warren, so all their names are in blue. So just to um, orient you in the, in the talk, I'm going to go back to the hub synthesis diagram that Rachel just presented uh, to show you where the projects fit. I'll then talk about the pesticide project briefly. So the title of the pesticide project uh, is quite informative. So it's Ecotoxicology of Pesticides, on the Great Barrier Reef for guideline development and for risk assessment. And so I'll talk about the issue that we really wanted to tackle, um, how we got together with our primary end users uh, to devise ways to do that, and then the outcomes from the project. And the same thing for the cumulatives project, uh, cumulative impact project. So this was actually called From Exposure to Risk, Novel Experimental Approaches to Analyse the Cumulative Impacts and determine thresholds in the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. So this was a multi-year project, um, which also had an extension, which was 5.2, and that was led by Sven. So this is a diagram that you've already seen, and both of the projects fit squarely into that box there. So investigation of environmental exposure and risks in Great Barrier Reef waterways, and this feeds into other aspects of pesticide management. So when you drill down into that box um, in the, uh, on the website, you'll come up with this flow diagram. And this flow diagram explains how the work that we do um, contributes to risk assessments. And so in order to assess the risk of pesticides on the Great Barrier Reef, we need to know the concentrations in the waterways, so the concentrations of each of the pesticides, and that's done using monitoring programs. But then we also need to know the toxicity of each of those pesticides. And so the best metric for toxicity is actually the water quality guidelines, because the guidelines are not just the toxicity to one organism, they're the toxicity to a whole range of different organisms. And, so, and that's a very formal process. So once we know the guideline levels and where they're set, then we can compare the concentrations in the environment. Are they greater or lower than those guideline levels? And that gives us an indication of the risk. Um, Rachel mentioned that it's not just individual pesticides we're interested in, it's really the fact that most samples that we get in the reef and in the catchment contain more than one pesticide, and on average they contain about five pesticides. And so we really need to know the risk of the combination of those pesticides together. And so not just the risk of you know, the, normal, the normal ones that we find, like diuron and atrazine, but also the alternate pesticides which turn up in a range of samples as well. So our project feeds into this red box, so the toxicity information of pesticides to aquatic species. So more specifically, there have been around 50 different pesticides that have been detected in the reef and its catchments, but we only have good guideline values and good data for around 20 of those. And so there are a range of alternate pesticides that we find very difficult to assess the risk of because we don't have those guideline values for, com for comparison. 
So we need to develop guideline values for the, these alternate pesticides, and the way that we do that is to use a species sensitivity distribution. And so the species sensitivity distribution is comprised of toxicity data from a range of different tests. So we have multiple species, not just one species. We need at least five, and we aim for eight or more. We can then plot the proportion of species that are affected against the concentration of pesticide. On the bottom left, you can see the first dot represents the most sensitive species. In the top right, oh, my, my screen's just gone off, so I have to look up there. On the top right, we've got the, um, the least sensitive species, and we can then relate, that curve relates any concentration to a proportion of species in the community that might be affected. And so this is how we derive the 95% protection concentrations, which is a guideline, and the 99% concent, uh, protection concentrations, which is set to, preserve, to protect 99% of species in the community. And so this is essentially how it's done. You simply draw a line across from the 1% of species affected and drop that down, and if your concentrations of pesticides are below that, then you're protecting 99% of species in the environment. So this is a relatively conservative um, guideline, uh, but that's the target that is applied on the Great Barrier Reef, the PC99, um, because of the, you know, the high ecological value of the World Heritage Area. So for these alternate pesticides, we clearly needed more um, toxicity data, quality toxicity data, to derive the guidelines. So we got together with our, our primary end users, so the Department of Environment and Science, particularly the Science and Technology Division, and uh, also the University of Queensland. They provided us with a list of priority data gaps that we essentially needed to fill with a bunch of ecotoxicology tests. And so at Ames, we conducted the marine species test, Shelley Templeman's group at, at uh, Trop Water, did the freshwater tests, and Jochen Mueller's group did the chemical analysis. And there was a really strong focus on tropical species, not only because this was NESP funded, but there was some data on the toxicity of some of these alternate pesticides, but most of that data was actually from temperate systems. So in order to ensure that we're protecting tropical species as well, we really wanted to make sure we balanced up the type of toxicity data that we had. So in all, we tested around 21 alternate pesticides in up to 16 different tropical marine and freshwater species. So probably the main outcome, numerical outcome of the project was that we've now got 91 new toxicity thresholds which can be used to improve and derive water quality guideline values uh, for these alternate pesticides. So it's important that this data is properly scrutinised. More than half the data has been published in peer-reviewed journals. Um, we'll publish the rest of it over the next year or two, and that's all available in, you know, online in the final report, um, all that unpublished data. So the outcomes uh, are broader than that. They certainly contribute to the development of new water quality guidelines. Um, and those revisions have been done by the Department of Environment and Science and the University of Queensland. Um, these aren't just used on the Great Barrier Reef, they're also, also to be used nationally in the national guidelines. Uh, the pesticide reporting portal is where you can find a lot of the monitoring data for pesticides. And on the pesticide reporting portal, it also gives you the guideline levels or the guidelines for each of the pesticides so you can compare what the monitoring data is telling you. I mentioned before the importance of understanding the risk of the mixtures and not just the, the individual pesticides. And so when we have samples that contain diuron, atrazine and three alternate pesticides, we can start to include the contribution of those pesticides to the overall risk, which we haven't been able to do before. Um, I mentioned before also that with the pesticide risk metric, um, ideally, we just want a single me risk metric for all of the pesticides together. Uh, that's been developed by UQ and uh, Department of Environment and Science as well. Um, so we can now um, include the alternate pesticides in the single pesticide risk metric uh, 
Uh, this is, or has been, applied in report cards already. And now that we've got the alternate, or data for the alternate pesticides, we'll be able to improve um, the accuracy of those report cards as well. And finally, the, the pesticide selection tool is a new tool that's being developed at the University of Queensland and again, Department of Environment and Science. And so this is where each of the pesticides toxicity or relative toxicity and the relative mobility are brought together in a very simple way so that, end, so that farmers, farming groups can start to choose pesticides that have a lower um, potential effects on aquatic ecosystems. And so that's been developed now, uh, should be published soon, the first version of that, but subsequent versions will now be able to include some of these alternate pesticides as well. So moving on to the, uh, the last part of the talk, this is very short. Uh, it's on the cumulative impacts of water quality and climate change. The problem that we're tackling here is, as we all know, the Great Barrier Reef is being affected by more than, one more than just one pressure. So there's climate change, which where we're getting more frequent heat wave events, for instance. There's a range of water quality issues which are affecting inshore um, regions as well. But how these come together and affect organisms and what that effect is quantitatively in terms of their responses is really unknown. And so when we have multiple pressures together, are they acting additively, synergistically or, or um, sub-additively? We need to know this so that we can decide which of them are most important to tackle when it comes to managing water quality. So we got together again with our, some of our primary stakeholders, in this case, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and also uh, the Office of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we ran several stakeholder um, uh, workshops just to identify what the problems were, what were the, the data gaps and how to go about tackling them. Uh, we wrote a report on that which came out in 2016. Uh, Sven's the first author on that. And since then, we did a range of experiments. It's mostly experimental, this project. And so we worked in the National Sea Simulator, where we uh, exposed everything from corals through to seagrass, a lot of these you know, really important marine species to um, the impacts of you know, climate change scenarios, like 2050, 2100 climate scenarios, uh, also heat wave type ex exposures, but also in the presence of different water quality um, stresses. And so anything from pesticides through to sediment deposition um, reduced light, which is similar to TSS. We then quantified what the responses were. And so all of this data is now available to go into models that can predict the effects of multiple pressures on the reef. We also developed um, some of our own methods to predict the responses of multiple pressures. And again, we use the data from our experiments to validate those models. And finally, um, Eric, um, Laurie developed a visualisation method um, using eAtlas, an interactive tool, to illustrate some of the issues of, of cumulative impacts, but particularly how um, doing different management interventions may change the consequences for the reef. And I think Eric may be talking about that tomorrow. That's what Sven said anyway, so I'm uh, not sure. Um, this project really, as I said, it quantified the effects and developed methods to predict the effects of multiple pressures. There were 16 publications from the project, um, so all that data is publicly available. Um, I don't have time to go through all of, the, all of the potential outcomes from this project, but because we're talking about pesticides, I've just chosen one to show you. Um, I mentioned before the way that we derive water quality guidelines, and this is always done um, under optimum conditions. So ambient temperatures where they're not under any kind of stress. And so that raises the question, are those guideline values, are those guideline, water quality guideline values applicable when we have other stresses happening at the same time, such as heat wave events, for instance? Um, so we ran experiments on this, but we also developed a method where we could predict how a heat wave event of any, um, of any scale or any temperature might affect the water quality guideline values. How does that affect the PC95 or the PC99? And so we hope that that kind of 
that kind of response or that kind of information can be used to adjust pesticide risk assessments um, for other pressures such as uh, heat wave events, for instance. So I think um, that's just an example of how quantifying these issues uh, can help us prioritise ways uh, to, um, to help manage uh, the Great Barrier Reef and water quality. Um, so thanks very much to NESP. Um, thanks to the RRRC for the great management of the projects. Uh, I'd also like to thank our key stakeholders for their um, participation and um, also their, their collaboration in the project. Thanks. Thanks, Negs. And while I've